Welcome to the Integral Stage and to a new episode in the Meta Model series. Today we're talking with our longtime meta theoretical partner in crime, Edward Berge. Edward played an essential and influential role in our several year long explorations on the Integral Post Metaphysical Spirituality Forum, and we'll touch on some of that in our discussion here today. Edward is a playful and irreverent wordsmith and neologist, and the mouthful he has for us today is hierarchical simplexity. We'll take some time to go into what the hell that is, but I think it will soon become apparent that meta theory or meta modeling is not exactly what Edward is up to. He's interested in mapping and navigating the spaces in between theories, not creating a master model to include them all. Drawing on Latour, we might say Edward's forte and playground is infra theory, not meta theory. Infra theory, like actor network theory, is good for uncovering the hidden factors and influences rather than causal explanations. So with that said, I'd like to open up our discussion. Good to be with you, Edward and Lehman. I think after many years of online discussions, this might be the first time we're meeting together like this. Lehman, did you want to say anything by way of introduction? I'd like to repeat the phrase higher anarchical simplexity. That's fun. Uh, I'm just pleased to be here for another round of meta meta theory, exploring and evaluating the affordances and dangers of meta models and their makers. And I'm especially happy that Edward Theurge Berge is here. <laughs> we share a lot of things with him, not just our historical involvement on the integral post metaphysical forum, but also I think our collective embrace of pagan entertainment and high Buddhist theology, post postmodern philosophy, progressive political sympathies, energy work, linguistic playfulness, and above all, I think we share a a deep perception of the importance of the dynamic in-betweenness of things as the privileged contemplative and analytic structuring element of reality. So happy to be here with you guys. Thanks a lot for that. And um, Edward, would you like to say uh, anything in introduction of what is hierarchical simplexity? Well, I wrote a short, succinct statement, which I'd like to read because I don't think I can remember putting all these words together. So let's see. Meta theory is that which juxtaposes, organizes, and integrates theories. Higher anarchical simplexity accomplishes this via its principles of the same difference and the tensegrity that separates yet connects in the overlapping boundary spaces within and between a plurality of complementary yet autonomous theories. That's another mouthful. Great, yeah. I think Two key words in there probably, or at least uh, one of them is uh, basically the, the same difference, you know, the same with the slash difference there. And yeah, so what do you mean by that? Well, um, when we start with, for example, I have to pull up my notes. John Caputo, who um, is a philosopher who's main claim to fame, at least in my mind, has been his relationship with Jacques Derrida. And he coined the term where I got higher anarchy from is from him. And he describes it as the negotiation between the finite conditional and the infinite unconditional. So we hear a lot of talk in various philosophies about the relative and the transcendent. In his term, higher anarchy, he means something more like how those two concepts interrelate and overlap and mutually entail each other. So unlike traditional Western logic, which opposes them as opposites, higher anarchy tends to see them as operating together as one ontologically. They are of the same substance, so to speak, for lack of a better word. And that's where Derrida's term difference comes from, only he spells it with an A in that they are two different things, but they are also the same in that they are related in a relationship that is not in strict opposition. It's a different kind of logic. (laughs) 
Hard to know where to go from there. I agree. <laughs> I think one of the things that strikes me as interesting about that is the idea that if there's a concept that you can't think without another concept, then that relationship has to be the more fundamental structuring element. Right? So if you're going to think of the finite, you can't really think about it except as a relationship with the infinite and vice versa. So you're always thinking all of that every time. And that's the most primordial thought you can have in that area. You can't put one of them as more primordial than the other. Like there was an interesting thing you said in those notes that you sent us that the transcendent is only problematic insofar as people imagine it to be like causally prior <laughs> to the conditional realm. Because you're, you've made a, is your view that there's a thinking error has been made already as soon as that priority has been assigned. Right. Well, that's, uh, I think, through Caputo, I get a lot of my Derrida through Caputo because Derrida is difficult to read unless you know all of the background history of his philosophy and the terminology. Caputo kind of puts it in um, terms more easily understandable. <clears throat> and that's why for Caputo, the pre-originary principle that upholds what you just talked about, how these things relate, is not just difference, but what he calls Cora. Um, Harry Dodd did an in-depth study of um, Plato in the Timaeus where he introduces the concept of Cora, which is a place in between heaven and earth, between the infinite and the finite, which sets the precondition or the preposition of this, this originary space. And that's exactly its function, is to show the transcendental not, not the transcendent, but the transcendental condition of even discussing or bringing up any terms. You know, when we bring up any terms, you know, like in structuralism, it's based on their difference in relation to each other. But it's not just their difference, because obviously there's a space where they have meaning that transcends, in a sense, their, their individual difference. That's really a key point. And it's something that we've all moved around and circulated around in our own ways in our discussions on the forums over the years. You're speaking of, of same difference and uh, hierarchy. Uh, my introduction of, of Latour and Michel Serre's uh, framing of prepositionality and Layman, you know, he early on when we first met him, and that's kind of where we all connected, he was saying things like the separator is the connector, you know, that that boundary condition is both uh, something that distinguishes, but also inseparably unites these elements. And so it, once you really grok that, it kind of uh, changes the logic that you work with. Um, so I've, you know, I think I've appreciated kind of the, the Trinitarian perichoresis that <laughs> we all three have engaged in, in, in kind of exploring um, this alternative logic and way of framing things. So there are two things I'd like to ask you about, and you can run with one or the other, or, or both of, if you, you, you know, can weave them together. One is that you've framed this in dialogue with Ken Wilber's integral theory and the way he's laid out aqua. Um, so I'd like to maybe ask you to say anything about like, what you see this brings to or distinguishes itself uh, from, you know, Wilbur's framing of integral theory. And related to that, you've kind of had a long ongoing conversation uh, with Mark Edwards and his version of, of integral uh, meta-modeling um, where you found a lot of resonance. So I wanted to know if you maybe would like to, to comment on that as well. Well, we're all familiar with the infamous aqual diagram on the X and Y axes. <clears throat> and I think that is a good model for showing the difference between various um, ways of looking at things, in, out, individual, plural. 
but what the diagram doesn't do and what it almost prevents us from looking at because of the nature of the diagram, which is very linear and dichotomous, is the relationship between the quadrants. So that's why in my article for Integral Review, I started out with an image at the top of my article, which is basically circles within circles within circles, showing the overlapping spaces in between the circles. So if we use the Aqual diagram and make them for circles that interconnect and overlap in the spaces between, that I think is what these concepts add to the Aqual diagram and, and its philosophy as well. And this relates directly to Mark Edwards' work and particularly his later work. I referenced that 2015 article he did with a couple of other folks on um, the spaces between. He used a the bridge as a metaphor for showing how those relationships between theories, between objects, between any two things, people or otherwise, are disintegrated. And I like that um, hybrid term he uses, disintegrate, as opposed to integrate, how that relationship between objects is held together by <clears throat> the bridging metaphor and, and bridges. He uses um, a term that I really like. Uh, bridges themselves are held together by tensegrity. Uh, tensegrity was made popular by, I'm trying to think of the name of that guy who did the geodesic dome. Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller talked a lot about tensegrity structures and his geodesic dome. <clears throat> and that's how they are held together is through the dynamic tension throughout the whole structure in, in the relationship to the structure as a whole, <clears throat> as opposed to the individual parts being separate. Um, to me, that also relates to, to my study of martial arts and dance how the body itself is held together. We assume that you know our skeletal structure is the framework. Well, it is in a sense the framework, but two bones don't ever touch. They're all always separated by some kind of connective tissue, uh, cartilage, et cetera, et cetera. And the Fascial structure of our bodies is throughout our entire body. And it doesn't just connect bones together, it connects the entire body together as a whole. And this notion of tensegrity or syntegrity, as Edwards and Crew define it, um, doesn't have a center, so to speak. It's a virtual center. We're going to, we can talk a lot about virtuality as we go on, but it's the center is actually distributed in the relationship held together by the tensegrity of the structure itself. So I think these are missing elements in the Aqual model. So these concepts kind of expand on the model. It doesn't erase it, it doesn't replace it. It just kind of adds something to it. It's kind of like a glue that holds it together. And that's, I, I like the term glue as well. It's another term I use, another metaphor I use for these ideas. It's kind of the glue that holds it all together. I'd like to come back to the danger of centers, but first I'd like to um, probe a little bit into, into spaces and different ways of holding spaces, because it seems like there's a conceptual tension between people who are envisioning uh, meta perspectives as a kind of overarching thing where there's a larger space 
in which you could construct the model and that model could come down and intervene perhaps, or at least draw things up to itself. And this other version where um, the meta space is really an interstitial space of terrains between these zones. Now you could say those are really just a left and a right hand way of saying the same thing, right? That each one implies the other when it's done properly. Or you could say that the interstitial spaces are the reality and the superstructural space is an illusion or perhaps even an unthinkability that we shouldn't be toying with. Which way do you lean on that? Well, um, that's where I bring in um, Lake Evan Johnson's work on image schema and metaphor. I did an analysis of the model of hierarchical complexity uh, because it bases a lot of its math and a lot of its structure on the superstructure you're talking about, which is uh, a kind of unfolding into a higher space, a superstructure. And in my critique, using uh, the cog psi, it's not that that is wrong per se, because some of the guiding metaphors for that superstructure are the container image schema, which is a valid schema that we use to interpret the world. We learn this very quickly from, well, even from in the womb, we are contained inside the womb. So we understand containment inside something from the very beginning. Um, as we're growing up, we put water in a cup. We understand something being inside and contained in something else. So the container schema is a predominant schema used in like the superstructure model of hierarchical complexity. Um, it, it's based on, you know, set theory. Set theory now is the fundamental superstructure of all math. So one set theory, there are others. One set theory that the MHC uses is the container. And it's one that Wilbur likes favors also, you know, his diagrams of um, circles within circles within circles. You know, the, the body is surrounded by a bigger circle of the emotions, which is surrounded by a bigger circle of the mind, a bigger circle of the spirit. So it's not that that's wrong per se, because the lesson that I've learned from the Cogsci is that that is one image schema that starts with its premise. And that's the premise being, you know, things are contained within other things. It's just that when looked at, when that is looked at with what I would call an old school metaphysics, meaning that this one schema is the basis for all things and the MHC is used to measure everything. Wilbur has a theory of everything. It's all contained in these concentric embedded circles nested within each other. And it's a very useful schema and it's, it's a very appropriate in certain circumstances. But the mistake is, and here we get into the interstitial fluid and spaces, we talk a lot about post-metaphysics, integral post-metaphysical spirituality. Post-metaphysics, as I, you guys talked about in your earlier presentation, isn't lacking in metaphysics. It's just questioning the metaphysics of presence or, or um, I'm trying to think of the, the terminology, the metaphysics of foundationalism or essentialism. You know, that. And here we come back to our same difference. The metaphysics of the higher spirit creating the lower material. Um, the metaphysics of what we can see and feel here and now being the result of a metaphysics of first principles like from Plato or even Aristotle. And it's a very dichotomous worldview at the very heart of the MHC itself. 
So it's not that it's wrong, it's only wrong in that it takes its particular prefer metaphorical preference and applies that to everything. Whereas in Cogside, there are other image schema and other metaphors and other blends of metaphors throughout the ages that different philosophers have taken to be their primal framework for looking at the universe. So there are actually a plurality of philosophies. There are actually a plurality of models and philosophies that can be understood through the, the cogsci and the cognitive linguistics of how our brains and our body minds perceive reality through these various schema. So that's where the shift from the metaphysics of essentialism to the metaphysics of between comes in. It's a post metaphysical shift to seeing these, this plurality of ways of looking at the world, these various lenses, as Mark Edwards would say, he himself has um, elucidated a variety of lenses. And he's even wondered, well, where do these lenses come from? This is where they come from, from the exploration of our cognitive capacities, how we perceive and interpret the world through a variety of lenses which are consistent within themselves, but they are not consistent with each other. For example, I talked about the kind of set theory the MHC is based on. It is certainly one of those set theories, but there are other set theories that challenge some of the presuppositions of the set theory, set theory they use. So for me, it's a paradigm shift in the underlying premises of how we approach models, how we approach philosophy, that changes our underlying paradigm, our underlying worldview of how all of this stuff meshes and interrelates as opposed to one of them being the superstructure of it all. You filled up my head with too many possibilities for questions. You've got to <laughs> um, there are several things I'd like to ask you about, but I'll start um, selfishly with the relationship of your image schema to what I've been calling um, prepositions in integral grammatology. I think you're talking about the, the need to recognize the multiplicity of lenses and to be able to employ them in different contexts, not to try to reduce everything just to this one container schema um, framing, which is what uh, MHC does, right? So I would like to, yeah, just hear you riff a little bit on how you see the relationship between image schemata and as they're represented in, you know, cog sci and cognitive linguistics and what we've been exploring, you know, metatheoretically as prepositions. Well, um, when I was reading your auto choreography, another hybrid phrase that I like, and one of the topics I want to get to using new language for new concepts and, and new paradigms. You have the prepositions as one, and they are in linguistics, one of the elements of the grammar between nouns, verbs, adjectives, and prepositions. But I think it was Latour, and you can correct me if I don't remember correctly, which is entirely possible. Prepositions are indeed one of the elements of grammar or one of the elements of speech. But even prepositions in linguistics have an added element because image schema aren't all prepositions. There's obviously nouns and verbs and other elements of speech in, in image schema. But the concept of prepositioning that element of prepositions um, is exemplified in actual linguistic prepositions because they are linguistically the glue that connects nouns and verbs and other parts of speech. And they also, as many image schemas do, 
deal with um, space and our relationship to gravity and to space and between ourselves and other people. Containers in and out, going from here to there. So this connects to some of the abstract philosophy of, you know, Derrida, because it's more the embodied version of those principles and concepts. Because, you know, our image schema are very embodied things that make those connections that place us in relationship with, again, here we have our prepositions with and between each other, even with and between ourselves in our own physical, emotional, psychological makeup. So I think the, by breaking it up into like with a hyphen, pre-hyphen positions, pre-position, um, connects the image schema, a very, embod very embodied empirical study with some of the more lofty abstract notions of our philosophy, like, you know, Kabuto and Derrida and, and even Matai Maka, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it forms that connection to our bodies and not just our physical body, but our emotional and mental bodies between our other bodies, between culture, even, between, even in spirit, we'll get into what spirituality is. I think with Mod Hayamaka and enlightenment, I love, I love that term. So it's kind of like an embodiment of principles. And that's why for me, higher anarchical simplexity being the abstract philosophical mouthful it is, to me embodies principles. Any metaphysics has to start with, you know, its premises and its basic axioms and principles. And to me, these are some of those axioms or principles of an embodied philosophy. So we're, we're looking at a plurality of cognitive capacities, schemas or lenses. Each of them, if it was extended adequately, could form a set of um, viable meta modeling strategies. Each of those could be self-consistent, but that doesn't mean they're consistent amongst each other. And they're all embodied. So when we think of them being embodied, are, are we thinking of them as primarily originating from the embodied condition of a contingent human being at a point in evolutionary history? Or are we thinking of that embodiment as accessing underlying computational patterns and architectures that could then be expressed in these schemas, which could inhere in a complex algorithm, which we can't predict and see the consistency of, but might still have some kind of architectural self-consistency of its own. Yes, um, I think it, it relates to, you know, the broader physics of the origins of the universe. I mean, you know, my study of Tai Chi philosophy and practice like all cosmologies, you know, starts with what is from the beginning. In the beginning was whatever. So Mahaya Maka, uh, Taoism, Tai Chi theory, philosophy, sees our embodiment in the here and now as expressive of these primordial and originary principles inherent to the universe at large. It's our way of trying to grasp those principles of the universe at large and interpret them through our embodiment. You know, we, you know, these theories start from our observations from, a, from ancient times, our observations of the sun and the moon and the stars. And, you know, obviously there's some kind of pattern to all of this. They have regular repeating periods of cycles of orbits. So most of these philosophies, if not all philosophies, start with, you know, our observations of nature. 
at large in the sky, in, in the heavens, as well as on the earth. Um, tai Chi, metaphorically, has been said to originate from, you know, the originator, a mythical character, observing a, a snake and a crane in interaction and fighting, and how their movements related. So it's not just post facto that these things originate, it's, you know, from the beginning. Everyone's trying to understand how these principles that guide everything manifest in the here and now, in my relationship with you, in my relationship with my dance partner, in relationship with my opponent in a fight, in my relationship with culture and, you know, trying to transmit inherited knowledge. Again, using metaphors, these are bridges or glues, principles that are philosophies of cosmologies of, you know, how, how things operate in the universe. You've been mentioning Madhyamaka, and I'd like to go into that in a little bit. Um, but first, before we go kind of too far down the line and, and, and lose the thread, I wanted to just ask you, in your application of these uh, embodied schema and the, the, you know, the logic that image schemata can give rise to if we think about the, you know, the, the between and, and the hierarchy that you've been talking about. Another distinction that you make that you've, you've brought in from Lakoff is between real and false reason. And I'd like to just ask if you had anything to share on, you know, the difference between real and false reason and, you know, possibly how false reason shows up in, uh, you know, in some developmental models or, or integrative models? Well, um, his distinction between real and false reason goes back to our different kinds of metaphysics and the assumptions that they're based on. Um, obviously, we're all familiar with classical logic from Aristotle and um, trying to think of the terminology, but um, including set theory, the MHC, the principle of the excluded middle. Um, it either is or it ain't. And there's no in between. That's classical logic. It's based on necessary and sufficient conditions, whether something fits in a category or it doesn't. And this Metaphysics is useful. The scientific method, you know, is partly um, an expression of it because in the scientific method, we don't look at things in their totality and their relationship with other things. We separate them out and put them in a lab and isolate an object under very specific circumstances to see what results we get. And obviously, this is very useful. There's no question that it's a very useful approach that has you know, advanced all kinds of wonderful things in medicine and other applications. But it's a metaphysics that also leaves out putting that subject or object back in its natural environment. So when we talk about um, false reason, I think that's part of what Lakoff is talking about, this abstraction of separation, of the dichotomy of separating things into ideal categories and looking at them that way. And it's an abstraction that ignores how reason functions based on an embodied model. And that includes, and much scientific empirical evidence has you know, shown this, like the works of Tomasio, the neuroscientist, that our so-called earlier developments like feelings, 
and emotions, even our body schema, are not included in these abstractions of you know pure reason. They are separated from, like I said before, we put things, subjects, and objects back in their environment. And even within an individual person, we have feelings, we have schema, we have emotions. And you know, the classical notion of reason is you know, Spock from Star Trek, completely based on logic alone. Whereas he's always in distinction or relationship or even conflict with Jim, who's always so emotional. <laughs> So, you know, Star Trek itself represents a lot of these um, archetypes, prototypes of who and what we are. So to me, that's where the grounding of real reason comes in is, and you know, there's been a lot of research on much of our reasoning isn't just all this abstract separation from our world. It, is influenced strongly by, you know, our emotional predispositions. Um, Lakoff is very big on political framing, you know, framing arguments, which the conservatives are very good at, at doing, you know, getting to our emotions, usually our negative emotions like anger and hate and fear. Um, but we also have emotions like love and uh, compassion. So, Real reason includes all of that. Cognitive science empirically examines it, supports it, whereas false reason is that abstract reasoning based on Aristotelian principles of the excluded middle. Right there, the excluded middle. The post-metaphysical philosophy is the middle is from where it all comes. <laughs> you can't, if you exclude that, you're excluding life itself. So there's a logic, uh, a limited form of partially useful logic, which has over dominated in human life and which expresses itself in a certain um, pattern of languaging. And therefore, when we have insights outside of that, which are more true to the actual operating of the system and ourselves, we need to form linguistic structures to help us do that. A lot of the things we're discussing are... Um, a lot of people would find there'd be very arcane patterns that we're trying to bring forward. And I can see that it's obviously extremely useful for us to invent new words to help solidify, clarify, and make intelligible these patterns that we want to be able to remember and communicate. But how important do you think it is generally, culturally, to try to bring forward new languagings? Um, it is a challenge. That's why in my own languaging, which I do frequently, is as opposed to coming up with a totally new word, which people go, you know, what WTF is that? Um, I try to play with the language in terms of using words we already know, but hybrid and, and playing with and connecting them with other words or other prefixes or other interjections or other juxtapositions in a phrase, higher anarchical complexity is one of those things. Hierarchical complexity is a very common word in metamodernism, in integral theory. So it's a very accepted, un, un, pretty well understood term, phrase in the philosophy of post metaphysics. I just tweaked it a little bit and put the N between higher and archy in quotes. And instead of complexity, synplexity using the prefix sin. So for me, that's how I do it with just tweaking understood and accepted language and adding a couple little elements and little, little twists that make us go, literally tweak our heads and go, huh? What? So for me, that's how I play with the language in introducing different concepts. Now, obviously, both hierarchical complexity and higher anarchical complexity to most human beings that don't study these things like 
the integral or the metamodern movements do go WTF in the first place. So in common language with most people, which is, includes most of my relationships and most of my interactions with the world, I might toy with that with just common expressions everyone understands and just you know, tweak them a little bit. So again, it's something that people usually generally understand, but might just put a question mark on the concept and it doesn't need to be expounded on. It doesn't need to be explained philosophically because most people don't give a shit about that. But it just opens a door, so to speak, by playing with a common language. It just kind of maybe plants a seed subconsciously in most people. And this is where we come back to framing. Framing is critical. Um, and I spend most of my time doing political framing online and in my blog, because this is where most people live. And that's where my main project resides in communicating with the general public and framing things in a way that challenges many of our unconscious suppositions about what reality is. And sometimes just tweaking a phrase or a word is one way, one avenue of opening into someone's dogmatic and rigid perception of how things operate. In a past discussion with uh, Lehman, I think we were talking about the utility of God talk. And I mentioned uh, a quote from Brian Swim that any theory that doesn't bring in new language can't be called a, a new theory. You don't want to overdo it with jargon or neologisms, but if you've basically just recycled all of the old concepts, um, it's not likely that there's been an eruption of the new into the formation. Um, so I'd like to you know, ask you to unpack a little bit, because we've been talking about this phrase of hierarchical simplexity and so you're, the, the wordplay that you've done with the second word there, simplexity, changing complexity into simplexity, um, where are you going with that? What do you want to suggest with that distinction? Well, it's, once again, it doesn't uh, negate complexity because there is no question of the usefulness of hierarchical complexity in terms of even you know, skills. I like Fisher's and Mascolo's version of using hierarchical complexity in the acquisition of skills. As someone who is highly skilled in some arts, there's no question that, you know, there's basic principles that you need to learn and to apply, which, you know, then requires you develop extensions of basic principles to advance in some kind of a progression of learning and skill acquisition. This is in cognition as well as anything, you know, Piaget and, you know, cognitive stages. These are not to be denied in any way. But um, I just started to read um, Tom Murray's article for the Metamodern Reader, which I can't uh, get too into detail about because it hasn't been published yet. But he also talks about the challenge of just focusing on the complexity. And it relates to the challenges we've talked about or I've talked about in so far, is that when you just use the, the metaphor or the lens of complexity, you spiral off into ever complex abstractions that lose their touch, and their grounding with basic principles. Now, they don't lose their touch with their basic premises, and their basic axioms, but that's one of the things I challenged in my paper on the power law religion, where those axioms come from. And 
these axioms from Plato and Aristotle are just assumed to be true. They're not to be questioned. They're just true. And then you build your system from there. But using embodied, embedded, enacted, and extended axioms, to use the Fourier example of Varela, Maturana, and Varela, and Thompson, uh, when you have those axioms, things change. So, relating this back to language, even the language used in these newer paradigms, they, they create their own hybrid sort of language and concepts to introduce a metaphysics that challenges the metaphysics of presence, the metaphysics of essentialism, the metaphysics of the excluded middle, and synplexity, for me, adding the, the sin as opposed to calm, to me, that is one way of challenging the obsession with complexity. It's not that it's not true. It's not that it's not valid. As I said earlier, it's just that it assumes, as its basic metaphysics, that that's the, the whole story. So synplexity is my way of saying there are other things involved. The image that I'm getting is of you not so much creating new words as hacking existing words, um, such that if you hacked all the points in the architecture of a meta model, all those points would then be open to some um, greater space or capacity or range of elements that would make it a healthier version of that model. And I'm curious about whether that outside space that the hacking permits is being imagined as a restoration to health or as a movement forward to a new thing. You know, when we think of words like simplexity or even Fuller's uh, synergy, right? There's a combining and a cooperating. Is that just the normal condition that we lose in the limitation of false reason? Or is that a new condition that we're trying to bring forth? And I think this will relate to politics as well, because if we take the Lakoff-Johnson idea where some people are neurologically predisposed toward the authoritarian model and some toward the egalitarian model, is the egalitarian model a step up? Or is that just the normal model and the other one is a collapse of that model? Okay, well, this is um, something I talked about before in terms of real and false reason. Because, um, and also included in hierarchical complexity. So, uh, in my paper for the integral review from capitalism to the collaborative commons, it's not that it's not just a false equivalence. It's not just that we need to take the liberal and the conservative worldview and somehow find a middle between them. It's not like the concept of health and disease that we need to find some middle ground between them because the middle ground between health and disease is partially diseased. So in this notion of same difference, the health comes in in the balance and relationship of valid, mutually complementary ideas. But democracy and fascism are not valid, mutually complementary ideas. One is healthy and one is really effing sick. So to answer, put this in the context of your question, yes, uh, to use, I think, I can't remember the guy's name, maybe Bruce can help me out of this, but we're using the always already and the not yet and that relationship. So we're using, you know, as you talked about the hacking of the language, I'm using what's already there. I'm hacking into what's already there to imply what isn't yet or that condition, that excess that has not yet been manifested 
that potentiality that is inherent to principles of our universe, that things could be expressed or function in a different way. So obviously the goals of metamodernism and integral studies is to go to what's next, what's not yet, but what's next and to try to formulate. So it's taking what already is and trying to find a structure, a frame to define where we're going. Um, Metamodernism integral is all about, you know, what's next? What's the next step of evolution? And not just that, we get to define what it is, therefore we own it and we tell you what it is. So, and obviously to some degree, I'm doing the same thing because I think we need to have those potentialities explored of what's next to move into something. I ex- in my paper, I explained that that's the collaborative commons, which is a very genetic, generic term, but uh, it's taking an old concept of the commons, which has been around forever. You know, what we share and own as, as a culture, as a group, as a city, as a principality, and how we share it by adding the word collaborative to it. Collaboration doesn't mean the elimination of individuality. It's how autonomous individuals work together to create something more. So in that sense, it's not a separation of individual and social. It's not one or the other, but how those things once again relate in the space between. So, however, that is in distinction from because individuals collaborate and work in the space between to create fascism. We have the autocrat, the dictator, literally dictating, you will do what I say or you die. Well, that's not the kind of collaboration we're looking for. That's the unhealthy version. So I like the metaphor of being a hacker because hacker in the good sense, there's the hacker in the bad sense, you know, hacking into, you know, the systems to destroy and cause confusion and chaos. But I think even there's a term in, um, you know, some of the modern uh, or metamodern or integral movements of brain hacking of trying to hack our brains and our systems and our minds and our models to open up those spaces, open up some potentialities for healthy development, healthy growth, which includes obviously hierarchical complexity. Uh, That's, I think, its goal. And I think that it's a very appropriate goal to take us into higher spaces of understanding and cognition so that we can see and understand a very complex world and how to navigate and create something like democracy. Well, what comes after democracy? Well, that's the question. And my linguistic hacking, as I said before, is one of those techniques of framing some possibility spaces of what could be. Just for people listening, um, the person that you were referring to with the always already and not yet um, is David Michael Levin or yes. Michael Kleinberg Levin. Yes. Um, and about hacking, I don't know if you ever heard that uh, maybe a year, year or two ago, Benita Roy did a podcast where she talked about uh, six ways to go meta. And one of the ways to go meta was a hacking kind of move. Um, it's not always rising above. Sometimes it's also a kind of hacking into and opening up um, what's possibly not recognized that's that's latent or virtual. Um, so I think that's one of the moves that you can make. Another move that she talks about is actually going laterally, which is what, uh, you know, uh, 
speculative realism and, and object-oriented ontology said is, you know, instead of just starting with this premise and, and then working on it, let's just step to the side and start from a new place and see what happens. So there's that kind of lateral move that's a, you know, a meta move. And another one, you know, I'm thinking about, which is one we've been circulating around several times is with Between, with William Desmond. And he points out that the meta is, you know, also betweenness in his metaxology. Um, he goes over at least four different kind of frameworks, the univocal or univocal, um, which basically is monistic. It sees everything as one or it reduces to a privileged one. The equivocal, which is basically a kind of a dualistic approach or a pluralistic approach. And it just sets a lot of things alongside each other um, without much um, ability to decide among them. Um, then there's the dialectical, which is that move which seeks to erotically <laughs> transcend the options and include them in a new whole, uh, but which he then critiques as in some sense, encapsulating in a new sameness that, that can be seen as erasing of differences that we've been wanting to preserve in the different ways that we've been discussing here. So his next phase is metaxology, uh, where he says that uh, there's not only that, that erotic movement of subsumption within a dialectical new whole, but that that is always among others, you know, and there's, there's this overlap. So it's like this overlapping circles in the, the flower of life, like you like to privilege, or I think the overlapping circles that you're going to find in a collaborative commons. Um, so anyway, I didn't know if you wanted to just, I'm not really posing a very articulated question with that, but I know that we've kind of thought and explored around some of those themes and wanted to know how you feel they relate to, to what you've been exploring. Well, I'd like it to bring it down from philosophy into dance practice. This dance practice includes all of these ideas and principles, as, as does martial art. So the movement art of dance, we sidestep, we backstep, we forward step, we lower our body, we raise our body, we shimmy our body, we roll our body, a lot of these image schema are expressed in the practice of dance. Um, and even in our connection with our partner, in partner dance, you are dance connecting with someone else. So dance connection is one of the first principles of learning how to dance. And that connection is accomplished through leverage and compression. These are all very physiological, I, um, manifestations of abstract principles. So when you connect in a closed position, meaning facing each other, holding hands, guy's hand on the woman's back, her left hand on his right shoulder, it's not this, just that you're connecting at those places, you are creating between that connection, both leverage and compression. The leverage is accomplished by the man and the woman shifting their entire bodies slightly away from each other, which creates a leverage tension. But also you're compressing, the two hands are slightly compressing into each other. And the leverage away of the whole body, the man's right hand and woman's left scapula, when you leverage the bodies away, there's a compression of her scapula into my hand. So there is a light tension, not a hard one, a light tension. I talked about it as in Tai Chi, the four ounces of connection, the four ounces of resistance. It's a light resistance between partners, but it's also the same light resistance that we use in our own bodies, connecting our left with our right, our front with our back, our top with our bottom. So even just standing in a posture on our cell, by ourselves, just to hold our arms up requires a certain amount of dynamic tension. 
if we just let no tension in our arms fall by our sides. But that tension is not, you know, squeezing and really hard muscular tension. It's just the tension in our fascia to hold our arms up. It's very light. So in our dance connection, we want it to be light so that we can feel into each other what we're communicating through our touch. And through my dance practice, through my hierarchical complexity of skill acquisition in dance over two decades, this connection is critical. It's the very foundation, principal foundation of all dance is the connection. And the better your connection, the more easily you can communicate with your movement, with your touch, with your partner in a highly complex language to do highly complex advanced movements and choreography spontaneously without being pre-planned. So again, we have the separation connection, the same difference in dance connection. We have, you know, all these other principles like movement in various directions, sidestepping, moving forward, progressing, regressing. Um, so a lot of the things we talk about abstractly in principle, every single one of those things applies to dance as a movement and partner um, interaction. So that's why I like to not just talk about you know, philosophy, but how philosophy applies to daily life. And in, in, in dance, for example, again, at the more advanced levels, uh, when you have your connection really down, I used to travel around the country and go to dance conventions. And social dancing, you, you know, just pick a partner out of the crowd and you dance. And if one advanced dancer dances with another advanced dancer and they've never danced together, it's irrelevant. Because once you've embodied all of these principles, in not only your own body, with, but in your connection with your partner, amazing, spontaneous, creative things happen when you're dancing to the music. Musicality is critical in advanced dancing because you're not just running through your mind, your patterns anymore that you learned. You are using all those patterns that have been now in your body memory to express in a different way to whatever the music is telling you to do. And that won't be the same every time. Two advanced dancers can dance at the same time 10 times and it will be 10 different dances because something different will be emphasized. Something different will pop in from your body memory. So this is where the creation comes from. From learning such complexity, but then reducing it again to simplexity of combining all of that and the music into an entirely spontaneous and new creation every single time. It's not gonna be completely new. There might just be one or two things that are hacked from your repertoire. And, and every once in a while, the pros who do this for a living and dance you know, hours a day, every once in a while they create an entirely new move that has a name. So bringing all of this down to earth, down to the dance floor, all of this is in, is in you know, the, the dance itself. Now, I guarantee you that I'm probably one of the few people on the dance floor that can talk about it like this through these abstract philosophical principles. But we do talk about all the time, the principles of dance, dance connection, dance structure, dance movement, you know, has a lot of practical principles explained in terms of the art, but that are actually broader and more general principles applied to, you know, philosophy and abstract thinking. It's all there. I'd like to probe the question of whether this, um, amazing creative result from skill capacity and the use of tensegrity for dancing and Tai Chi and 
you know, maintaining dynamic interactions of same difference with that four ounces of pressure and resistance, is that always a good thing, right? It seems like it describes the dynamic by which uh, a satisfying and creative flow state is generated. But is that always good? Or are there flow states that are superior to other ones? You know, if we look at the political situation, we could see that some people might get into a state like that in a way that, relatively speaking, is bad for the country. Or, you know, the battles between the Jedi and the Sith, they both seem to be able to get into some states like that. But how do we decide among them? Well, and that is, that is a good question. And I don't know that I have a, a complete definitive answer. But um, relating it to our current political situation, there's no question that um, the negative framing of uh, appealing to and activating people's anger, their hatred, their xenophobia, um, is in a literal sense, and empirical studies have validated this, it's growing their amygdala beyond its homeostatic size in the brain. Now, the word homeostasis is used by Damasio a lot in his neuroscientific work. And again, homeostasis is not stasis, it's not a static condition, but a evolving dynamic balance between our interaction with you know, survival. So you're right, um, there is, touched upon briefly earlier, this notion of false equivalence, false reasoning, that growing our amygdala at the expense of the rest of our brain causes us to grab our guns and go out into the street and shoot each other. This is obviously not a good thing for society. And this is determined by society and culture as a whole over time in a complex progression of cultural skill acquisition. It seems to be generally accepted if you're not a fascist, if you're not a murderer, <laughs> that this is what's good for society. So as a society, that's one of the main arguments right now why some, actually many Republicans are coming over to Biden. It's not that they agree with Biden's policies, it's just that they agree that with the societal and cultural institutions and agreements we've made over time, that it's better to, you know, not hate other people. It's better to try to get along so that, you know, we manifest a more healthy public space. We know about health in the body. Well, it's also the health, and that's very well explored in, in medical science, the homeostasis that we need to achieve, not just to live, but to thrive and be healthy and happy. This also applies to, you know, cultural health. And I think most cultures are pretty aware of and have decided what is required to do that. And right now that is the struggle in the United States and why many Republicans are coming over to Biden is they just want human decency again. You know, we have in our fearless leader, Twitler, you know, the beginnings and the increasing development of a fascist state of a dictator who is literally committing genocide on the population with their response to this pandemic. Obviously, as the pandemic is not good for the health of people and society, even our economic society, so is the infestation and the pandemic of fascism, which is unhealthy for society. So that is one of the critical questions we are exploring right now in our election, is what is a healthy functioning society and what is a diseased dysfunctioning society. And it seems even Republicans agree with Democrats that it ain't what we got. 
we had a dialogue or a trialogue together in the integral review journal on generative enclosures and thinking about healthy and unhealthy societies and, and generative enclosures. I'm only mentioning that as a conversation that I want us possibly to have in the future. Um, and right now I'm aware that you have to go relatively soon to another um, meeting. Um, but I, there was, so I apologize for a little bit of an abrupt turn here, but I wanted to make sure we cover one point before you have to finish. And uh, so one of the other elements that I think was important in your hierarchical complexity is the middle way Buddhism or Madhyamaka. And there might be a way to finesse that answer and to relate it also to some of the social political that I think is important. Um, but I'd like to just touch in with you about that, um, the role that uh, that middle way thinking has played in, in the formulation of both your meta-theoretical, infra-theoretical and political thought. Well, as we've just been discussing, um, at least the version that I favor that supports my thesis, and there is quite an argument in the Tibetan community about it itself. The one I favor is that um, the ultimate and the relative are in a mutual and telling relationship ontologically, meaning at the heart of our cosmology, at the heart of our metaphysics. But they are separate or in a sense conflicting in terms of epistemology, how we interpret that. And that means they use the terms nirvana and samsara. You know, the right perspective and the mistaken perspective, the illusion. And in all the things we've been discussing about health and disease, politics and everything else, samsara is that perspective, that way of knowing that dichotomizes and sees things as separate, as heaven and earth as being different, as ultimate and a relative as being completely separate with no included middle, middle excluded. And I like the way you pronounce it. I, I obviously never heard the correct pronunciation. How do you say Madhyamaka? Madhyamaka. Madhyamaka. I like the yamaka. It's kind of like the thing you wear in your head. Uh, the middle way itself is that healthy balance of the middle way as seeing both the ultimate and the relative as empty of inherent existence. Inherent existence, once again, is that philosophy of essentialism, of presence, that metaphysics uh, of foundationalism that posits, you know, the ultimate God above deciding and telling us on earth what needs to be done. And if it's not God, it's some higher principle. So that's how it relates specifically in that the healthy understanding of their ontological relationship is the healthy knowledge of that relationship being nirvana. The unhealthy understanding of that relationship is samsara, which is the illusion. So that's exactly how that relates to what we're talking about in terms of health and disease, um, you know, better and worse. Um, it's not. That's why it's so confusing when we talk about the balance of mutually entailing complements, sometimes it gets confused with, well, it's just, then that means that, you know, fascism and democracy are just a, a balance of somewhere in between. That's not the same middle, it's a different middle. All middles are not equal. <laughs> I, I also like the way Bruce says Madhyamaka. I tend to say it a little bit more, maybe Italian, Maria Mica. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, do you have any thoughts on how we tell what are the appropriate mutually entailing compliments, right? Because our, our ancestors had a kind of intuitive take. It seemed obvious that heaven and earth and my right and my left hand and male and female kind of went together. Today, we've made that a little bit more complicated in our analysis of the world, but also, we don't necessarily know, like, why does my left brain go with my right brain to form an appropriate, optimal, dynamic relationship in the middle way, rather than my left brain goes with a pencil? 
Like, how do we tell that? And are the things we think are unhealthy the result of doing a middle way procedure on two things that are not appropriate complements? Well, yes. Like we were saying, the um, samsara is exactly that, doing a middle ground of two things that are not natural complements. How do we tell? Well, that's what we've got a couple thousand years of culture and science to help us understand. So that's why in terms of our meta theory and our metal models, we use a variety of them. We look at you know a variety of them and show where they are consistent, where they do overlap, where they support each other. But we can also show where they don't overlap, where they don't support each other, and where they challenge each other. So there again, we have that balance of using our, our vast knowledge, which we have access to now pretty much. We have access to it all through our internet. So in our research and in our meta-theoretical uh, approaches like Mark Edwards, and I can't wait till he's on, he looks at all of the different theories. So you take all the theories, kind of like Wilbur did, you take all the theories, you lay them out, you see how they relate, where they support, where they challenge. And that is a progression of learning culturally. So we have thousands of years of culture to help us to learn that. In addition to our, our always already, we have our not yet of further exploring those things and progressing and adding to that knowledge base and going in different directions and different growth, different depth. So I am firmly a believer in the cultural progression. Now, a topic for another discussion at another time is trying to think of the guy that wrote the structure of scientific revolutions. Kuhn. Kuhn. Now, he's, he says scientific revolutions don't have that progressive continu continuation that it erupts and completely challenges the previous paradigm. There's, there's room for that also, but that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to just thank you for this conversation with us, Edward, um, for all of our years doing this, uh, conversing on forum posts. Um, it feels really good to connect this way, and we probably should have done this a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I wanted, I, I'm, I'm conscious of your time, so I'm not wanting to, to take you too long. I know you want to get ready for your next one, but is there anything else that you'd like to share that you feel is kind of unsaid in this conversation? Well, um I don't know that it's been unsaid, but it's certainly been implied that, you know, from listening to you guys do your first presentation, that post this thing called post metaphysics, we're all onto some very similar ideas and concepts. And in our own interactions with each other over the years, um, it's helped us to find those shared spaces between our own connections as well as define our own individual expressions and preferences to still define our own autonomous being. So I think our relationship over the years through the forums and today is an actual representation of what we're talking about. That we are all connected to the idea of post metaphysics just being a metaphysics that challenges essentialism or foundationalism or representationalism. But there are individual and group ways of preferences and directions we can go with that. So be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful. I appreciate very much seeing you, and I love the, you know, the coherence and the breadth and the ethical orientation of all your thought, and it's nourished me a lot over the last few years, so thank you. Thank you both for being part of this journey. Yes, thank you, too. It's been a real enriching uh, part of my life to know both of you, and, and also I've really enrichment for my morning today. And I'm hoping, Edward, I will see you somewhere between Sin City and 
multiplicity. Right. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'll be there. All right. All right. Take care. All right, guys. See you later.